Joining us now is Tom Calandra, the publisher of the Calandra Report. Good to see you, Tom. Hey, good to see you, Mark. Now, uh, just so people know, and I actually just discovered this uh, off camera, and it's very impressive. So you started Market Watch. Yes, I was That's one of three Mar people. Marketwatch.com. Yes, now owned by Dow Jones. When we started, it was 1996, and um, we, we started it under the umbrella of a data company. So that's how we incubated it. We gave away data, and then we attached editorial to it, financial editorial, and we sold part of it to CBS, the television network in, the, in America. Because it was part CBS Markets Watch yes. for a while, yeah. And then part of it to the Financial Times of London. We sold it to that. It became the largest financial news service, and we also had te television, radio. Uh, I, of course, I, I was the editor in chief and chief commentator. Uh, we sold it to. Uh, uh, Dow Jones in 2004 for about $520 million U.S. And so um, a lot of hard work, but th th those were, you know, crazy uh, internet times. And it's still the largest, uh, as I understand it, financial news service on the internet. Well, Dow Jones Market Watch now. I, I use marketwatch.com uh, every day for uh, my sourcing, in part, among many others. But, I mean, that's fascinating. So you were very early. Did you see something, or were you just lucky? No, I had a, a, a partner, a fellow who's my former editor, Larry, and uh, at Larry Kramer, at the uh, uh, he was my a former newspaper editor. He said, "Come back from London, where I was working for Bloomberg in London." He said, "There's this thing called the internet," <laughs> and that's what started. It came back to California, and we started. It. Wow! And we created the editorial component, you know, the data component, and we went public. It went nuts, and then it went to. You know, it went like this, then like this. Yeah. But it was a real company. It was always a real company. Right. And it's still a great, great product with great news, great editorial. Absolutely. About financial. Right. So there's your, there's the, the bio, a little short bio. Let's let's talk about uh, why, why we have, why you, why we have you here, and that's to talk about interesting things in in the mining sector. How about palladium? In case people haven't noticed, uh, record highs. Forget about gold going to two thousand. Palladium's way ahead of it. So why is it at 2,500? Is it a bubble? And, and uh, what do you think? Right, welcome. Palladium is now at about $2,200, $2,300. It's outpaced the rise in the price of platinum by, by 2x at least in the past three or four years. Palladium is associated with much more with EVs, electric vehicles, and its use uh, for, for clean uh, uh, vehicles when it comes to uh, uh, electric vehicles is much more than platinum which is much more associated with diesel. Platinum got hit hard a few years ago with the diesel scandal, the Volkswagen diesel right. scandal, uh, uh, where they were fudging their numbers. And it's just starting to recover from that. Remember, platinum, they're all part of platinum group metals, right. the sphere of platinum group metals, not PGM. the stock. Right. Yeah, they're all PGM metals. Yep. But platinum is 10 times rarer in the earth than gold. Yet it went back down to eight hundred dollars. It went below the gold price, which was unprecedented. Gold's at about sixteen hundred now. It's coming back now. All the, all the PGMs mark will come back in a big way. One day you're going to wake up and you're going to see the platinum price and the palladium price are going to be up 30 40 percent in a day. You'll see that. Of course, we've seen tremendous gains in both those metals. There are some, there's a supply demand equation. I, I I mean my ownership comes in two or three ways. We own platinum uh, and palladium coins, which some mints, including Canada, does have a beautiful platinum coin. I own Ivanhoe Mines, which has um, probably the largest undeveloped PGM product in the world. I've been to it four times in South Africa. That's Robert Friedland's Ivanhoe right. Mines. How long have you held uh, Ivanhoe? Well, I owned it as a private company in 2003. I okay. still own it. We own about 100 and something thousand shares. It's trading at three dot something US or four dot something. Uh, I expect it to go far higher. It's a three billion dollar company now, but that that doesn't appreciate that, that doesn't factor in also that it has a big copper project in the DRC Congo. But I mean, there are other ways to get exposure to cop to platinum group metals developers and producers. I happen to own Ivanhoe. Um, All right. And so, uh, what else uh, excites you in the market right now with uh, people watching this interview? What, what, what's exciting? Uh, maybe guide us in a certain uh, direction. Well, what you guys do, I mean, you know, because I've, I've appeared on your, your, your material and, and you do a great job reaching ordinary folks. Thank you. Individual investors, yeah, you really do. 
is you have to remember when you, when you invest in either commodities, whether it's a metal or a crop, right, or even oil, which I don't really know that much about energy, or the actual equities, that there are so many divisions among them. Gold is a very challenging market, or can be, because it's also a financial commodity. And the juniors, as in the small companies, like $1 billion market caps and less, are very fragmented. When you look at iron ore, you could probably point to three companies worldwide that are responsible for 40 or 50 percent of the global shipping traffic of iron ore daily. Like a Rio Tinto. Yeah. Yeah. But try to get that with gold. You'd have to name 50 companies mm. that are responsible for 50 companies that are responsible for 30 percent of the actual global shipping traffic of gold. Silver is probably even more fragmented. And then there are subdivisions within that. You know, what do you want to be? You want to invest in developing companies, to developing a real product, a real mine. You want to invest in the riskiest uh, segment, the explorers. You want to invest in the royalty companies. Right. You want the to Franco invest Nevada's in the, of the world. Yeah. yeah. Franco Nevada's the, the gold and the mines, the metal royalties, the EMX royalties. Do you want to invest in the producers, right. the larger companies, or the emerging producers like Victoria Gold and Yukon? Victoria Gold, okay, there's a name. So, so Tom, as we, as we wrap this up, I'm just wondering, uh, all your best ideas, I'm sure, are reserved for your subscribers, but are there, uh, you, you mentioned a couple of names. Any other names I own that some of them. we should be looking at? Well, I mean, I mean, I'd love to give you a name that I'm not investing in right now. I have a very small but long stand, oh, long standing. I mean, six eight month position in an explorer in Quebec that just came out with terrific holes, seven holes across long inter, long thick intercepts, azimut exploration. They're azimut, using. okay. Yeah, the stock was up 175 percent on Monday or Tuesday, and it's Quebec, James Bay. I'm hoping that azimut exploration and its uh, its technologist slash founder slash PhD doctorate technologist geologist uh, Jean Marc Roulin. It does for the James Bay what, let's say, Great Bear Resources has done for Red Lake. Um, yeah, that was a big one last yeah, year. Yeah, uh, emerging producers, I like Victoria Gold. And, um, you know, on the royalties, I like uh, Golden Valley Mines. I like EMX. Uh, I like Metalla. And um, I'd love to come up with a name. I have no vested interest yeah, in. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's good. You see, this, you see this? Ideas, ideas, ideas. You just gave us a whole bunch of ideas, so we appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. Oh, thank you, Mark. Good stuff. All right, uh, Tom Calandra of the Calandra Report.